Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. This lecture is basically for uh, uh, either instructors who are teaching this course or for self learners who are trying to uh, basically see uh, you know how many lectures they should follow and what are the fundamentals about. So, if you listen to this then you can plan uh, for the course. So, that is where uh, this is and the ecosystem aware global supply chain management. This is the title of the book that is uh, that has been published already by World Scientific uh, uh, this year. So, and uh, the well, the contents of this lecture are let us look at the motivation uh, uh, for starting off this and the ecosystem model and the grip framework and look at applications green supply chain design if possible and some conclusions. So, uh, what we are going to uh, do is look at uh, uh, the various things. The first lecture is on motivation that is how global supply chains have evolved. Supply chain networks have evolved from single owner vertically integrated networks into globally dispersed multiple owner company networks. This is a big big difference that is because if you look at the supply chains like what Henry Ford had in 1930 or later the General Motors and Chrysler and even IBM and Intel and others all big companies they are basically are vertically, integra vertically integrated meaning, meaning they can be global they can be anywhere in the world, but there is only one owner and the owner is either IBM or Intel or uh, whatever or GM or something. So, it all basically started with the the, uh, the auto companies uh, because auto industry is the industry of all industries. So, and then the, the whole thing started in uh, 1913 the assembly line of Henry Ford which is very famous where he basically has streamlined all the processes that are involved in the manufacture of the uh, uh, of the auto. Uh, this one and I created an assembly line that is he has people at the various uh, uh, one after another and the, the, the parts pass from one to another and they assemble as they go along. So, but then the governance mechanism of the so called vertical integration came from Alfred Sloan. Alfred Sloan of uh, the General Motors, he was the one who basically gave an organization structure that is efficient to govern this. I mean, Henry Ford was basically has is the is a big inventor of uh, the assembly line, but the, the governance mechanism of the assembly line uh, as the product lines and all that was given by by Alfred Sloan. So, but then with the outsourcing what has happened in apparel in electronic and other industries including uh, the auto, they, they this has been globally dispersed or regionally dispersed, but there are multiple owner networks. In the auto you have the design is done by General Motors or somebody and or Chrysler or Toyota, uh, but there are several part, uh, partners or suppliers who supply the materials against the order from the OEM or the original equipment manufacturer Toyota and so on. So, this is the kind of evolution that has happened. Now, when the evolution of uh, the globally dispersed multiple this one has happened, each control company controls their respective nodes and links. Now, if you want to represent this entire supply chain as a graph then each company, each supplier is a node, each OEM is a node and so on and then you can have edges depending on who is supplying to who. So, this is basically a graph and coordination and collaboration with network partners becomes a necessity. 
well it could be a market oriented mechanism where you order something and you are paying for it and so you basically uh, have, to, have to follow but that need not have to happen. So, the coordination and collaboration between people between the network partners becomes uh, an absolute necessity. So, the, when we have got evolved uh, from vertically integrated to global supply chains there are several factors that come into consideration. So, what are those factors particularly if it is global when the supply chain partners are over all over the world some in China, some in India, some in Singapore and some in the US and so on then each country has their own laws, each country has its own labor laws, its own financial laws, its own fine currency and its own universities. So, basically when you are dealing with with uh, multiple partners you are not alone dealing with the company you are dealing with the company's ecosystem which means that the resources the company has the finance interests that the company has to pay the foreign exchange it has the government rules regulations and what is the kind of logistics infrastructure they have what is the IT this one and all that this basically matter. So, that they can affect your supply chain. So, there are issues outside of your supply chain which are which basically are called the investment effort, investment climate affect your supply chain. So, what is the state of operational supply chain today? Efforts of stakeholders for the last two decades has resulted in high performance, highly connected and high risk prone supply chains. Now, this is the one that, that has happened in the sense that since these are globally dispersed and each one is trying to contribute to the other and they are all in connected by internet, they are all connected through logistics suppliers and people want to imitate the kind of uh, just in time uh, the things even for global supply chains they do not want to keep the inventory. And, and these are the kinds of things they wanted high performance in terms of lead time cost and so on. So, with the result they become very highly connected, highly connected in a sense people have developed clusters in, in uh, high, high, high performance clusters in countries like China, like in India and so on either whether it is a service cluster or a manufacturing cluster. But then what happens with all this high connectedness it becomes high risk. If something happens to a lack of disaster strikes a place and if it has a very big cluster let it be auto cluster or electronic cluster then the whole electronic industry or the auto industry in the whole world gets affected. So, when people have started doing uh, the globalization and making the supply chains highly connected. Well, they basically did not care for the high risk prone or the fragility of the supply chain because of the high connectedness. And now today what people do is because of the high risk people try to manage the risk as an afterthought. So, they have a risk officer and so on in the companies and lot of times that the global supply chains are getting affected because of some event somewhere in the world however trivial it is and the efficiency gets this one. In other words what when some unforeseen event happens somewhere in the world like a fire in a supplier's factory then that supplier is supplying something uh, some component which is critical and the whole production gets delayed. So, you will lose to your competitors because your competitors are sourcing from some other supplier and so on. So, these are the kinds of things that can happen with the, with the global supply chains today and they are happening. If you look at the literature, the newspapers and so on like whenever there is a tsunami last time in 2011 uh, uh, the tsunami there were lot of effects of this. So, there is a need for the supply chain redesign. So, what we are saying is 
the supply chains were very well designed for after two days two decades of hard work and they are well designed think, taking into account just the supply chain aspects of the this one in other words they are worried about the inventory they are worried about uh, the deliveries they are worried about uh, the quality of the product and the cost factors and all that but when it is global and each supplier is affected by their own ecosystems by factors extraneous to the supply chain such as political economic climate regulations delivery infrastructure in the locations of the partners changes in the availability and cost structure of resources and host of others now is it possible one thing is to take or up into effect all this as an afterthought like an exceptional event and so on but then when an event occurs every day it will not be an exception anymore it is a part of your operational procedure so when it is affecting your operational procedure you need to take those things into account and redesign your supply chain that's what we are trying to do here so redesign of the supply chain that was taking into account all these factors is a necessity so that is the aim of this course the aim of this course provides is with tools frameworks to manage globally dispersed manufacturing and service network operations to deal with multiple strategic operational issues such as outsourcing green revolution regulations and tensions with network partners increased transportation costs and regionalization you can add a lot of a lot of other things like currency fluctuations uh, uh, you can add piracy uh, you can add terrorism and all that so the point the point is that you have the supply chain which is which is well managed and it has high performance in terms of cost lead time and so on you are able to supply to the customers whatever they want whenever they want wherever they want but if some unforeseen thing happens then either the quality of the supply of the product suffers or the lead time suffers or the cost suffers who will pay for the extra cost the customer or the company so there are companies because of the extraneous events which were closed down which went into bankruptcy so this that's where the importance of this course is and prerequisite for this course is a basic course on supply chain management because we are not going to deal with the supply demand matching we are not going to deal with the inventory control and all that so we assume that all that is done but the question is is it necessary to study all this to understand these basic requirements maybe may not be if you have an idea if you are a supply chain manager doing all this but you have not done the basic course but still you can get benefit from this particular course so let's see this course is in five parts so the part one is introduction to the supply chain networks so we give an overview in lectures 1 and 2 of the supply chain networks i mean uh, this overview is special here i mean this overview is useful uh, for following whatever we are doing hence forward in the course in the part 2 to 5 so we talk of a type of networks they are global or they are local or they are regional kind of thing that affects because if they are global then they are cross countries you have customs and all that if they are local there are no customs but still there is a transportation but the transportation is either truck by a train but it is not ship ship one and there are three sub sub networks there are demand supply and service networks in other words the supply network is from uh, the 
suppliers to the manufacturers, the demand network is from manufacturers to the, the retailers and the service network is after sales service. Now, these are the three sub networks which are important and the three dominant business processes are procurement, manufacturing and distribution and retailing. So, we are getting here giving a higher level view of the supply chain, what are the processes, what are the sub networks and who are the dominant players. The dominant players are component manufacturers, contract manufacturers, logistics providers, retailers. And dominant themes are lean, total quality management and outsourcing. So, these basically are the three ones that are called high performance. Uh, why do you outsource? You outsource for cost advantages. You want to reduce your cost. So, the cost of doing outside plus transportation plus other thing is cheaper than doing it yourself or you may not have the core competency of doing something, but that part is required in your uh, in your equipment like for example, the Intel processor, you may not have the competence to use the processor, to, to, you, you have the competence to use the processor in your laptop, but you do not have the competence to manufacture that. So, that is where you buy it from outside. There is the this one. So the, basically, it gives you uh, gives you an overview of uh, the supply chain uh, courses that people usually give, and we also gave one lecture on on Zara, which is a case study on uh, a, uh, a Spanish uh, fashion retailer, and so on. If, if one wants to add another case, Flexatronics is a contract manufacturer in electronics one can add that into to this. So, basically these three or four lectures is going to be the introduction and give examples of, uh, of this. That covers what is the introduction to this uh, course. And then we go into the part 2. Part 2 basically introduces the supply chain ecosystem. So, the ecosystem, its definition, there are four constituents to the ecosystem that is the supply chain, delivery service, infrastructure, resources and institutions. So, usually supply chains are treated in isolation, but they are affected by the resources. For example, for running the supply chain you need power, water, you need industry clusters. They act as resources to your components and so on you need transportation, you need ports, infrastructure and others. You need banks to give you loans, to give you letter of credit, to give loans to your customers. So, basically the, the issue is that the resources become an important part of the supply chain, although it is not considered today. Now, any changes in your resources is going to affect your supply chain. Supposing there is increase in the uh, in the human resource cost, which is happening in China, India and so on. So, when it happens, the low cost advantage just disappears. So, do you still outsource? You have outsourced earlier, went to China, uh, created all the uh, logistics of uh, outsourcing just because it is it is a low cost affair, but the low cost disappeared. So, you still want to do it. So, this is the big question that comes in and there are institutions. Institutions are the governments and social groups. At one point in time, the governments were permitted, they liberalized the economies and so on. Well, things change every day, the politics, economic climate changes. As things change, the, the institutions or the governments may become protectionist. They may increase the export duties or they, they may decrease the export duties. They may liberalize for some products, they may restrict for some other products. So, there are changes that are happening in this, but that is going to affect your supply chain. And also, the delivery service infrastructure is becomes an important thing and because logistics cost is about 15 percent of the product. So, if you have faster transportation, and also efficient transportation, then you decrease that particular cost. So, 
you can you can look at various factors and we study in detail for each of these what are the what are the kinds of effects that they have in the supply chain. So, we had examples of global manufacturing, modular product, logistics, outsourcing and regulators, social factors and all that. We study the food supply chain in detail. And as a case, we suggest uh, metro cash and carry because it is a it is a, a metro cash and carry has is a German company, it is a wholesaler and it tried to enter both China and Russia and India. And in China and Russia it has no problems, but in India it had a lot of problems. So, the institution arrangements or the laws that they have in a, in a country become very important, they can even become stumbling blocks. In case of metro cash and carry everything is perfect. In other words, it connects between the farmers and the retailers. It is not coming in the way of anybody in this except some brokers and it is going to create efficiency in the supply chain. But still it went against an act called APMC act and basically half its half its business is controlled by that and they, they got affected. So, before any country gets affected the institutions and the regulations become very important. And the de deregulations cannot be taken for granted because they are political decisions. And also, there are cases on Nokia clusters. Uh, you know, Nokia has created a big economy uh, for the country, and uh, uh, so Nokia clusters could be a, a good uh, good example where the country has liberalized and it has invited foreign uh, companies to get these electronic clusters and that has improved the country's this one is the positive aspect of this. So, when you are looking at uh, the, the supply chain ecosystem, you can you can basically look at uh, uh, issues like the uh, supply chain ecosystem and the Cases, cases like cash and carry, the learning experience is that you should not ignore the institutions. So, whatever products you are going to offer, whatever business models you may have, they have to be consistent with the regulations of the country where you are operating. And they should also be, they, they should not be against the social aspects. And similarly, if a cluster that is created which involves lot of asset, which is asset intensive, it involves lot of investments by uh, by companies and it has to be and the return on investment takes long time. And when foreign companies come and invest, it has to have government support and it has to show that the government what is the kind of uh, uh, benefits in terms of employment, in terms of the total welfare of the people of the country and so on. So, the both the cases show uh, show the positive as well as the negative aspects of the institutions in the in this case. So, there are others you know you can look at uh, food supply chain, you could you could map uh, auto supply chain and so on. One of the exercises that we suggest here is when you are when you are trying to do this course, you take whichever if you are working for a company or if you are doing PhD in a university, you can map the ecosystem for your university. You can map the supply chain or value chain uh, if you are doing for a PhD program or if you are doing a research project. Not all any research, even a research project like a PhD has a beginning and an end. And whatever this one you have, you can you can basically the back into various kinds of uh, 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 various uh, goals and split them into modules. So, that is about this. So, we have we, the part 1 of this course talks about the, uh, the general supply chain part 2 specifically concentrates on the ecosystem. 
So at the end of part 2, you should be able to map the ecosystem. You should be able to map the ecosystem completely and then but there are examples in the uh, in the lecture about the auto, about the food and so on and also logistics, telecom. So, you take any vertical that you have healthcare, it is possible to map the ecosystem. Then what do you do with the ecosystem? You should be able to do, I mean by following the engineering principles, you should be able to do both analysis and design. So, what is the kind of analysis that you could use using this kind of framework? So, in other words, this is the part 3 which is a very important thing because we are trying to do the analysis of uh, using the supply chain ecosystem framework. So, there are 16 lectures in this and first one is about high performance global supply chains. Now, usually the performance of the supply chain you start with the suppliers, manufacturers, distributors and, and retailers and you can you usually do either simulation, queuing or, uh, or any one of these uh, uh, analytical methods to find out what is the total lead time and it is random in other words because the events are random you can find out the mean uh, the distribution of the lead time you can find out the mean and variable uh, variations of the distribution. So, you always want to have whatever the mean is you want to uh, minimize the variation. You do not want to have too much of variation in terms of the lead time. And similarly in terms of the cost, you want to minimize the cost, but uh, you want to have uh, the cost advantage here. So, but the, the point here is the lead time now depends not just on the manufacturing times and the delivery times between the stakeholders. It depends on when you are going to a customs through a port, it depends on the port authorities, it depends on the customs uh, clearances and it depends on the papers because there is a lot of paperwork that is involved when you are doing the customs. There are 180 documents need to be signed. So, you have to look at what are the kinds of documents that are needed. If document is missing then it get delayed. So, there are times sometimes on the average uh, things wait for from 8 hours to 8 days or even uh, 15 days at the ports. Once it is cleared, it has to be loaded onto the ship and uh, once it comes to the destination, it has to be unloaded and again have to go through the customs. So, you have to consider the customs duties this one. Another thing is that in terms of the resources is the labor productivity. Well, some labor are highly productive, some labor are, are low productive. So, it will take more time for some people to do the same task. And also, the, if you want an LCE clearances, the letter of credit, some banks may, may do it online when you uh, on, on, the, on your mobile, some bank, banks may take, uh, may take a couple of days. So, the, the issue I am making and also the finally the delivery mechanisms, I mean in some countries the infrastructure may be bad, the roads may be bad. So, for a truck cannot travel more than 40, 40 kilometers an hour and whereas in some countries it can carry, go up to 200 kilometers an hour. So, these differences in the environment or in the ecosystem will affect both your cost as well as your lead time. You have to take these things into consideration when you are doing the so called lead time or cost estimation. So, this high performance global supply chain in this lecture we consider these aspects. And of course, there is the risk in the supply chain, we have three lectures on the risk 
and a metal case. Now, the risk in a supply chain can come from usually this, the risk in, in the literature on supply chains is considered either the supply risk or the logistics risk or financial risk and so on. But I mean, there are, there are papers or research papers or books which talk about there are various kinds of uh, risks that can occur. But is it possible to identify all the risks and which source they are coming from and how to mitigate them? That's what we are going to do with this in these lectures. Now, given the ecosystem, this one, we have four elements in the ecosystem and the risk can come from all the four elements. It can come from the supply chain, it can come from the resources, it can come from the institutions which are government and social, this one, it can come from delivery. Now, in terms of delivery, it can be late deliveries, it can be defective deliveries, it can be piracy. In terms of the governments, governments may suddenly turn protectionist, they may favor their own local companies. And there could be labor strikes or could be social uh, groups inside can agitate against your company. So, there are several things that can happen. These could be rare events, but they could happen. Whenever they could happen, you should identify and try and mitigate them and see if they can, if you can manage them not to happen. And there are always research risks. The resource risks are your labor uh, productivity and your financial risk. That is, if the banks have problems, then you get into problems. And also, there is power shortage, water shortage, increase in your foreign exchange or decrease in your foreign exchange value. These are all risks and the risk could be either deviations, they are small risks which you can manage or it could be disruptions. In other words, there is a truck failure, it will disrupt your, your delivery that day or it could be disasters. There is a, there is a natural a tsunami somewhere or a thunderstorm which has wiped out the roads and it will take a month for things to come into uh, normalcy. So, depending on all this, it is needed that you talk about the risk and identify this. Now, people may say, oh, you know, everything is risky because any product or any service, any human being can, can uh, get sick and uh, can die or something. But the point is you should be risk aware. That is the risk awareness is the one that creates, that is created in these lectures. So, if you want to mitigate them or if you want to avoid them, what is the kind of thing, strategies you have? This is like diagnostic tests that a human being goes for. You cannot avoid diseases. You are careful, but you also test whether it is possible to avoid it. So, this is basically the mitig risk mitigation strategies which are highly important. And of course, the ecosystem framework for innovations. Now, this is an important topic because people think that innovations can happen only either in products or processes. But innovations can come from resources. For example, Google has created a search engine and it has retired, uh, created a website. So, what are the kinds of things that uh, you have come uh, because of the search engine and also the internet? You have Wikipedia which is online, which is free. You have uh, search engines where you can search for anything. You have Google Scholar, you can get any paper almost free if you are a researcher. And also there are several businesses which are built out of the search engines, for example, online advertising. If you want to search for a product, you can search using Google search. So, basically these resources which come they create innovations. So, I have given early examples of the recent innovations that have affected and similarly the uh, deregulation. 
from the coming from the institutions which is an innovation. For example, in several places the airlines got deregulated. Uh, you have uh, uh, things like Southwest and others who came into play and of course it creates competition for others but it is the benefit to the people. There is the regulation of telephone, telecom. Telecom everywhere in the world was controlled by the government because it links the information. But it is most of the countries have deregulated the telecommunication and you can see the effect of that. And also there is technology innovations like the mobile which has revolutionized all our lives, the TVs and others. So and there are business model innovations that come out. For example, home delivery is an innovation. You need not have to go somewhere. You can order online, order online and then you know pay online and uh, download your ticket. You need not go to the airline office. So there are several innovations which have come. It need not have to be product process innovations. And there is also need for co-evolution of the innovations. Innovation by itself, for example, containerization didn't take off till big ships were built and then uh, the trucks were able to carry all those uh, big uh, containers and so on. So the, any innovation it, it, has to, it has to evolve. So in our opinion the co-evolution of the innovations happens through these four elements of the ecosystem. For example the modularization of the products is an innovation in products that has led to outsourcing. How? It is because you have a modular product which is specified and that can be manufactured anywhere and there is a process which is standardized to manufacture it and there is equipment that you can use. So you can buy the equipment from say somewhere and use the process, hire somebody and use the technologies to manufacture in your house and supply it to some big company. So the outsourcing to low cost countries has come from as a result of the modularization of the products. And because of the outsourcing they have liberalization, because of the liberalization there is the logistics. So several things happened. So of the co-evolution here. So the innovations is another important, we spent some um, three lectures on this and we gave uh, an example of Semex which is an example of all the three. It can, it is risk averse and it has lots of innovations of its own. And of course, the governance which is very important topic. Now, if you look at the world uh, vertically integrated supply chain, I have mentioned that although it was Henry Ford who basically invented the assembly line and who has, which had revolutionized the auto industry and other industries as well. But it was Alfred Sloan who has this governing hierarchical governing structure which was came into being. Now we have globally dispersed supply chains, but who is the manager? Who is the boss? Who tells whom? That is missing. So in our governance chapter which is highly virginal, we have three, two lectures and we have also an orchestrated model. I am not saying there are not companies, there are lots of companies which are operating, but the fundamental principles of governance is not taught. So these four lectures and the example of Lee and Fong which gives these six lectures are the ones which will give you the total this one. So in terms of the what we call the grip network which is the performance, innovation, risk and governance using the ecosystem is fundamental and basically if you are doing any any of this I think you should go through all these 16 lectures with the examples and that will give you a fundamental understanding of, uh, uh, of uh, what the ecosystem, how useful is the ecosystem. Well, the part four is uh, global design. How do you redesign the supply chain? It involves two steps. One is what is called supply chain formation and second one is the supply chain governance. Now supply chain formation is, is basically like collecting all the information about all the people. In other words, you are in auto industry, you require various components. So 
you do research and find out which country has high quality suppliers which can whom you can trust who will pro deliver products on time at low cost uh, to your design design is yours and they should manufacture and give it and so on and of course in the process there could be it ip theft and theft and all that but still you have to collect each of them from india china from vietnam whatever all the countries for each component and you should find out whether what are the kind of equipment they have in which country they are living what is the ecosystem of that and what are the risks that you face if you source from them so once you collect all this information for all the components all the logistics providers and so on then this is like collecting the base information that is the supply chain formation stage then the next step is you have to for each order you have you want to supply uh, say 1 lakh uh, uh, shirts of three colors white blue and, and red to uh, somewhere in us and where do you select various things and at the end you should design it after design you should outsource for look for the yarn get the cotton get the cutting and then sewing and then ironing and then sending it to uh, the the retailer in the us so for each of these you have to select the partners so that is the governance mechanism governance mechanism is partner selection coordination and execution so people call this control tower like in the uh, in the power systems as well as in the air traffic control you have a control tower which basically gets all the information and manages all the exceptions if they occur and we do the green supply chain design it becomes a very very important topic that's because supply chains are responsible for the uh, the ghg gases what is a supply chain any product and service that you generate you use it is behind that there is a supply chain so if you want to reduce or have green products which means you should have a green supply chain and if you want to have a green service like transportation then you should have a green supply chain or a green service chain so basically it becomes very important green supply chain design we we had four lectures starting with the fundamentals of green uh, green and then use this uh, use the design how to select partners and how, what are the kind of governance mechanisms and a green supply chain has for both forward and backward supply chains because green means less resource usage recycling and there is carbon trading or less ghg uh, gases greenhouse gases and so on so all this requires knowledge and we, our ecosystem model is fundamental for the green supply chain we have the ecosystem map and based on which you could do the design so once you do this uh, this one of course there is the part 5 which is applications well in the applications we have uh, in the book of course we have only three one is the food supply chain and food security we have four lectures on that this is important particularly uh, in countries uh, uh, where huge populations and food supply chain is fragmented and we also talk about food security and how to supply food how to use ict technologies to improve the food security and of course we did the green supply chain design and smart villages now the the big thing here is this that is your ecosystem framework useful only for supply chains or service chains the answer is no it's much more general you can have 
ecosystem framework for villages, for cities, for regions, for countries, for universities and so on. How can this happen? Because you are always talking about the supply chains here. So, the fundamental thing is that if you look at any village or a city, what is a city, what is a village, what is a university? It is a collection of services, a bundle of services is a university, a bundle of services is a village, a bundle of services is, is a city. So, when you, when you generalize it in this way and if you look a city or a village or a university as a bundle of services or a, or a hospital, then you can see that you can have the ecosystem and instead of having one service chain, you have server service chains and all these service chains are governed by resources which the university, hospital or village has. It has the institutions which are regulations and it also has the delivery mechanisms. And of course, you are dealing with multiple service chains and it becomes more complex, but sure it is more complex any village or a city, but it gives you a framework which is orderly and general uh, to deal with to design a village. We, we have present, we present the smart villages and cities and of course, there is a location selection. Location selection problem is if you want to select a supplier or if you want to select uh, this one, then you have to do the location selection. So, there are four applications and one can have other applications doing this and these are representative applications where you can use the this one. So, what we have in the so far is that uh, uh, you know this gives you a big a big uh, this one about the ecosystem and its applications. Well, if you are a researcher, you could get into research areas like social networks and supply chains, transaction cost economies in the economic ecosystem framework, governance coordination control. In other words, these are for a generalized networks, governance, coordination, control are very important. Green supply chain and carbon trading, orchestrated model for a green supply chains. You know, there are companies like Olam International, which basically uh, uh, are doing well, but they require help. Location selection uh, based on investment climate, basically uh, there are all kinds of reports uh, from World Bank and other consultants and so on. But uh, if you follow the ecosystem framework, those reports could be better. Tax integrated global supply chains. How do you, how do you manage your supply chain integrating all these factors, ecosystem factors? Is it possible to develop a mathematical model? The answer is yes. But one should remember that when you are doing optimization with the kind of parameters that we have like resources, governance and so on, you may not have numbers all the time. You may have opinion, expert opinions. Like for example, if the, the governance good, you cannot get give a number for this. You can say it is good, it is excellent and so on. So, there could be some subjective this one. So, you should have mechanisms or models either analytical hierarchy process or some others or the machine learning techniques where you can use both textual and data uh, this one and then do this. And there is a lot of scope for, for the research and all this game theory, supply chain coordination and all that. So, there is several scope for further learning. So, for example, the five stern process. If you are a policy maker, what are the kinds of things that you should worry about? This is called, there is what is called STEM, people worry about science, technology, engineering and mathematics. But according to us, our framework, it is STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, regulations and policies and management. Management basically comes out of the governance. So, these are the four kinds of importance where you know there are five, five forces which basically govern 
any particular supply chain or a city or something you should consider all this for innovations as well as for uh, regulations. But of course, you know, what I think ultimately what do you say after at the end what should you ask question. Now, if you want to get a supply chain configuration given the government regulations, the investment climate, the vertical space, the company has to tread carefully with the right product services, planning strategies such as the location, partnership decisions and business models to succeed. Now, if you go through the, the, the whole thing and then the discussions that uh, in the lectures, you will find that the this is the summary of all this. In other words, whenever a company wants to start off, what are the products, what are the services, what are the business models that it is going to follow to succeed, you should take into account the government regulations, the investment climate, the vertical space and also the resources that are available at the, this one. It may look, it may look common sense, but it is not being done and this particular this one gives you, this course gives you a analytical way of doing those kind of things. The performance models, for example, their queuing and other analytical models, they can be developed for goods flow, the performance models. The models for design of governance mechanisms, you know, there are for partner selection, coordination and scheduling, there are a lot of work that can be done, the risk management and all. And also, there are mathematical models for orchestration, you know orchestration is fundamental, but it needs a lot of attention. You know, we have some papers uh, which we started this work uh, some time ago. And multi-tier procurement in this, you know, in other words, the OEMs are buying from suppliers to suppliers to suppliers and so on. So, if you look at the layers of the supply chain, there could be 10 layers, 12 layers and so on, you know, starting from the raw material till uh, the, the OEM and so on. But then one can see the risks, you know, if one of the lower tier suppliers poisons something or uses a cheaper material or a cheaper steel which can affect your, your aircraft or your automobile. Then ultimately the OEM is the one who is responsible for it. So, multi-tier procurement and as a platform becomes important and similarly the multi-tier risk, risk management. In other words, the focus of the supply chain is shifting from managing immediate suppliers to managing the entire supply chain network. So, smart networks and buildings. You know the service networks and construction were built several decades ago. You know even today if you look at the construction, you know people still get the rock, uh, this one and then they get the buy the wood and make the uh, doors, windows and all that. But is it possible to standardize these things? And also you have the buildings where which consume lot of power, right from paint to everything affects your power. So, can you make green buildings? Can you use less resources? Can you use less power to maintain your buildings and so on? New designs, technologies and management models are available to upgrade the existing ones and to build new ones. So, this can be if you if you basically look at the ecosystem model for a smart building, smart network, and then the innovations that are possible, you can design the whole thing. This requires process orientation, modularization, standardization, and so on. So, and to conclude this, you know, here we have the SAS framework holistically models all the factors that interact with the supply chain. So, in one page, when you look at the SES model, in one page you have the entire model, all the factors that you need to consider and uh, that is a big help. You may know them all of them separately, but putting all the experts together 
at one place at one table to discuss that can produce fireworks. So, it has several applications in improving the investment climate policy making re-engineering the companies developing infrastructure and several others. And while going through the book one can map the company village or city and can visualize opportunities for it. So, if you if you can look at every organization or the human being or the work that you are doing as a bundle of services then this will be helpful. Thank you.